Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, I recognize we're running a bit late, and I will uh, I'll make sure I stay within the 30 minutes. Uh, this is work that actually describes the, the kind of the data management portion of the lead project, describes a little bit about the Doppler source project, which is a complementary project, I'll bet on a, on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, lead would not be possible, lead and, and Doppler source would not be possible were it not for collaborators, uh, primarily Dennis Gannon, who gave a talk yesterday, Kelvin Drogemeyer, meteorologist at Oklahoma, Dan Reed at University of uh, uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Mohan Ramamurthy is the primary PI from Unidata, which is a, a key port, part of this, uh, this project. Bob Wilhelmson at NCSA, Sarah Graves at Alabama, Rich Clark at Millersville, and others, and uh, my postdocs and grad and undergraduate students, uh, funding through National Science Foundation and through Microsoft. I want to just describe some of the, the functionality uh, in the, the data subsystem. Uh, you know, primarily, I'm kind of breaking this up into, into three pieces. Handling community data, um, this is something that, you know, essentially we're kind of making this distinction that I'll make clear in other, in, uh, other pictures, but, but we're handling, but again, we have, to, we have to make this distinction, so I'll discuss the community data portion of this. And then also some higher level data subsystem goals that we're trying to achieve, namely access and location transparency, and how we're doing this, and then the, the uh, personal data side of things, the individual workspace side of things, and then Doppler source. Typical analysis that our users undertake, and this is, this is very common, I'm sure, to everybody in the room here, is looking at an observational, uh, looking at observational data and comparing that to model-generated results. So on the left-hand side of your screen is, is uh, Hurricane Katrina. I, I believe this is probably wind that's being uh, uh, visualized here based on the coloring. And this is a GOES satellite data. Now on the right is IDV. IDV is a tool that, uh, out of Unidata, three-dimensional visualization of, of, this is wind here also. So by comparing, you can essentially uh, view the uh, validity of your model or verify the validity of your model. One thing I wanted to point out is the kind of data. You know, there have been a lot of discussions about, about image data, and, and that's a, a, a piece of the data that the meteorologists, the mesoscale meteorologists are interested in. And just to point back to Dennis's talk, Dennis was talking about, you know, mesoscale meteorology, you know, severe storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, that's the scale of storm that, that our, our, uh, our researchers are, are looking at. But I wanted to just point this out uh, to show kind of the, the, the range of data products that, that we're dealing with. The uh, METAR data is surface data. Uh, the Ron Suns is, is upper air um, balloon data. ACARS is uh, aircraft. NEXRAD level two and level three data is from the Doppler radars. GOES data is satellite data. ETA data is uh, model generated data. And CAPS is a, a, a new uh, small scale radar that University of Massachusetts and Oklahoma are developing to deploy on a regional scale. Uh, and there, it's, it's essentially a sister project to lead. But if you look at what we've plotted here, we've just plotted basically the, the number of data sources. So these data sources are, are, are relative, are accurate only in the context of the fact that we're plotting these for an area, an 80 mile radius in and around New Orleans. This was actually done before the flooding of, uh, <laughs> before the flooding of New Orleans. Uh, we actually used the use case based on a Scientific American article that apparently we were one of the few that actually read. Um, <laughs> that actually, you know, predicted some of this. But I just want to point out the difference. So, you know, our, our, the ETA model data is probably the largest data. It's running at 41 megabytes uh, per event. I know people have different terms on what events are. This stuff is time is uh, um, time stamped. Um, uh, we're dealing a lot with a lot of time stamped uh, uh, chunks of data. And it arrives at a very slow rate. If we look at the cumulative rate, events per hour, it arrives at a very slow rate. So it's coming once every four hours and whatnot. As compared to, say, the, the CAPS data, which is relatively small, it's 62 kilobytes, but coming at a rate of 600 events per hour. And this is, again, just for the 10 sensors. 
uh, next red, you know, just comparing the, the next red level two data coming from the large scale Doppler radars comes in at uh, once every five to seven minutes, whereas the CAPS data is coming in at a much higher rate, is coming in at once every 30 seconds. And if you look at the, the distribution, so there's distribution in products, there's imagery data, there's, there's pure numerical data. And if you look at that file distribution, obviously we're skewed based on the CAPS data. But you know, the, the larger scale data is, is a, is a uh, small portion of the, the 41 megabytes is a small portion of the total distribution. So these are the, what, what Lee has designated the seven canonical, the, the canonical seven data sets that, that we're trying to make work, and then we'll expand into other data sources. Um, just, just to kind of pull out the research challenges that, that, that may get lost in the, in, the, in, the, in the set of slides is, you know, we're doing architecture work, um, building tools to acquire, use, and store the data, uh, the representation of the temporal procedural relationships in that provenance, automated metadata generation is, is a big one for us. And uh, you know the whole t uh, notion of, of of the temporal data and, and how to tag that and identify it. I like this slide. This is something that uh, actually started with our our program manager at uh, National Science Foundation, Steve Neacham, and then I, I worked it to kind of give it a a <laughs> a slant that I thought was a little more descriptive for lead, and then he kind of passed back and forth, and then he then used that version and kind of has gone through a couple different iterations. But, uh, but I think it, it captures very well, I think, what, what LEED's goals are and, and, and exposes some of the data management issue. You know, oops, we're, we're portal-based. So we've got a user sitting at a portal. You can look at the, the, the top third of the slide as being the, um, the users, the client-side services that, that, that the user needs in order to interact with, with, with the system. You can look at the bottom third as being essentially the, the uh, computational um, uh, uh, infrastructure that's actually running the forecast models and, and some of the, the dynamic capability. And in the middle are the resources that enable all of this. We've, we've introduced a, a notion of a, uh, of a workspace. And, and this is unlike the, the notebook. You know, the notebook that's come up in a, in a number of other talks, the notebook the user records down what they're observing about an experiment. The workspace, on the other hand, is actually capturing the experiment itself. So it's, it's a, a slightly different notion. Um, and I, I, would, I would consider the two. One is more you know, petascale peta, peta based you know, and, and back in the infrastructure, and the other is more sitting on a user's, uh, uh, user's laptop. There's tools that, that support the user, a geospatial GIS GUI query service. You'll see these in other diagrams. The experiment builder experiment GUI. This is Dennis's work. You know the whole experiment space constructing um, these essentially uh, workflow experiments, which are kind of based around the forecasting and, and, and executing those. And then the catalogs and the ontology and the back end that support that, with a break between, with a split between. And here you see the community catalog versus the personal catalog, and that's kind of flowing through that notion that I that I started out by describing. Down on the bottom. We've got information coming in from, from uh, sources. Uh, we've got the benefit of working with Unidata and someone else, I think Tomislav mentioned that uh, you know, he's working with, I'm expecting the uh, data products to be coming in via IDD, Unidata's IDD, which is an internet data distribution system. We're assuming that also. So you know, we're not actually going to the, the, the so, uh, sensors themselves, but we're relying on the fact that there's a, a dissemination system that's bringing them to a client. And we can install that client on, the, on, on sites in our test bed. But what we are doing, and, 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 um, and this is where, where LEED is uh, taking its, its year three challenge, is, is making more direct connections. And this would be in the case of the CASA radars, where the user can, you've got a sensor actuator relationship going on where the user can actually, uh, well, specific users anyway, can actually you know, use, that inform, use the information coming from these, these small scale radars to steer the radar. And Dennis mentioned this in his talk. So what you're seeing in this diagram is actually that, that relationship going on where the, the instruments themselves feed into a data mining, which data mining in this case is essentially a mesoscale detection algorithm, which is it's looking for tornado signatures. So you've got this running, uh, and, and when uh, something definitive enough is detected, then kicking off in, in notifying workflow, which kicks off a workflow engine, which kicks off a workflow. And this simple workflow is you know, we've got three data products that feed into some quality, uh, some QA, 
our model executes a certain analysis that's being done. So that's what's being depicted here, and that's actually the legend uh, describes that. But you've got that dynamic feature, and again, this is something, you know, we've got after year two of the project, we've got the infrastructure in place, and are now working on this, this dynamic capability. Those results are what's being published in the catalog on behalf of the user in their personal catalog. The resources we're dealing with are tools, you know, Alabama, um, the um, no, just forecasting stuff, yeah, simulation is all forecasting stuff, some of the data repositories and whatnot. So the tools that enable this. Pulling it back to a, a, a data product focus, you know, we've, we've broken down, uh, and I'm sure anybody who's gone through this effort will, uh, will appreciate the, 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 the time involved in getting this, work, getting this worked out in a collaborative project, but basically just identifying what the, what the resources are. You know, we've got, we've got meteorologists in, in the, on the project, and we've got, you know, educational people, but then we've also got two variants of computer scientists. I mean, those that, that um, are essentially doing research and understand the service-oriented architecture, and those that are essentially doing code development and um, don't necessarily understand or don't necessarily buy into or whatever the service-oriented architecture. I mean, so there, there's tensions uh, there also. So, you know, just identifying what are our resources and distinguishing the geodata products from other resources and viewing those all as, as one thing that has to be managed and managing those in a coherent fashion has, has been an evolutionary process and has taken time. Within our geo data products, you know, we look at observational data, model generated data, you know, we've got collections we've got to deal with, so there's that, that hierarchy above that, and, and that's actually very non-trivial for those of you who have dealt with it. Um, you know, data analysis results, so it's not all, you know, model results, it's not all observational data. Workflow scripts are another form, uh, you know, and, and in the model input parameters, you know, one of the key things we want to do is tie those input parameters to the output results through a system of provenance to better explain the data products. So tracking all this in, the, in this uh, context. And, and this is key, uh, and it, I've mentioned this a couple times already, but we're making the distinction between these community data products, which are those canonical seven data products I, I just listed, from the personal data products, which are derived data products, scripts, input configuration parameters, the stuff that, that essentially the, the, the byproducts of an experiment, and then also external data products. And this is where Doppler source comes in, because it's something quite novel here. So in order to accommodate, uh, you know, in order to kind of grapple with, with you know, how do we deal with these, these community products and whatnot, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're saying this is, a, this is common amongst, um, you know, this, this group, but we're, we're saying, okay, we've got a sandbox. The services that are in the sandbox will talk this lead metadata schema, which it took us nine months to pull together. Those that sit outside, those, those data catalogs or data sources that sit outside the, the lead sandbox will communicate to services in the lead sandbox by doing a crosswalk, a metadata crosswalk from whatever their schema is to the lead metadata schema. Common stuff, but it still had to be, um, it still had to be worked out and agreed upon. Um, I'm not, this is, this is <laughs> just to show evidence of something, <laughs> something that really does exist. This is not just me waving my hands. Uh, the lead, so we came up with this lead metadata schema, uh, and we're using it, you know, not so much necessarily in, in the, you know, in the, the data sources themselves, but, but to represent, uh, to describe data products uh, between services that are communicating. I, it took us nine months to reach agreement on this. This was, this was relatively painful. I'll show you the next slide. We're leveraging FGDC in order to do this, and now we've gotten adoption by the CASA project, our sister project, which is nice. We'll get some, um, um, some cross-fertilization because of that, because that's a fairly interesting data source. Uh, we're leveraging FGDC for this, and we've extended it. You know, we're, we're supporting the, the mandatory parts of that, and, and we're essentially, um, you know, we see our, our uh, some of the, the metadata attributes that we need to describe, some of the rich metadata attributes that we need to describe, things like precipitation, and, uh, um, you know, humidity, and some of the stuff that the user wants to be able to query on would, would essentially fall into this ent entity and attribute piece. Going back to the, the community catalogs, uh, or the community data sets, uh, again, we're working with Unidata. Unidata has something called their Threads Catalog. It's basically an XML uh, web, ser not web, section. essentially it's a piece of XML sitting in a web server that has URLs, a list of URLs 
to data products that are sitting on an open app server. In order to bring these into a service-oriented architecture, we've, we've, we've yeah, I, think, I think compromised here. <laughs> we've, then we've compromised the model, the service-oriented architecture model to do this. But we've, we've, we've yikes. Um, okay. We've essentially, um, we essentially import them. We've got three threads catalogs here, A, B, and C, through a threads plugin. So we've, we've actually built something into the lead resource catalog. And the resource catalog, which is, you know, which is built as a service, uh, a web service, crawls the threads catalogs periodically. I think it's doing it nightly. And it indexes the data products using Lucene and accepts queries as, as now name value pairs. Uh, it's, it's, it's working for us now. However, we are. Um, we're supporting more than, you know, but we're using a controlled vocabulary and an ontology and concepts so the queries can actually be in issued spatially and temporally um, and over these other conceptual uh, uh, terms. Um, but yes, we are right now supporting files, but OpenDAP allows the subsetting and aggregation of products. So we'd like to support you know, our backend storage. You know, we're accommodating the support of those as well. And, and how that actually flows into the, the front end, we're not clear yet. We're still working on that. As of right now, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and and um, yeah, and and we recognize um, things like this would be desirable, but not right now. <laughs> no, this is, I'm I'm proud of this. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. But obviously, this is fine as long as you know everything's a Threads catalog, which isn't it isn't going to be the case. So you know. Uh, new data catalog comes along. We're not going to write a plugin for every data catalog that we get. So the, the model that works is actually a model where essentially you've got a newly minted catalog X. The catalog registers itself as a service, uh, provides a crosswalk from its schema to the lead metadata schema. Someone can ask, well, who serves precipitation data? The service registry can say, well, X does, and the query can be issued. And that's the model that we're moving toward. This is our, you know, get it up and get it going model. And because the threads catalogs are such an important part of what we're doing, that model will stay there. That threads plugin will stay there. The, you know, one of the goals is, is access and location transparency. And, and that's basically just described in the diagram right here. You know, I, I've mentioned the, the lead metadata schema. Um, we've got a, a, a single query interface over which the user can issue high-level queries. We're restricting to a common vocabulary, the CF standard vocabulary coming out of Unidata also. Uh, those, you, you essentially issue a query specifying concepts like precipitation is a concept for us that the query service asks the NOASIS ontology. This is onto an ontology that's being developed at Alabama to break this down into terms that the different catalogs can understand and our, our community catalog and our personal catalog, the query gets issued over those different back ends and then the results come back and the data is often in binary and as, as I, I just alluded to, it's, it's often uh, file based. And we're using a system of global IDs to uniquely identify everything, which is actually quite interesting when we get into supporting uh, the temporal streams that we're, that we're working in in Doppler source is, is, is naming these things as one of our challenges. The geospatial GUI, and um, I will hustle along here. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit slower here than I want it to be. Geospatial GUI, we're using the Minnesota map server. User can specify, you can just see very quickly here, the, the user can specify a bounding box that queries for data products. The data products uh, come back. It's got a temporal specification and a geospatial specification along with some of these data categories. This is still uh, evolving. The personal data catalog is, is kind of evolving out of the notion that, that you know, your local file system is not adequate. I think this is an argument that doesn't need to be made in this, this group. So there are, there's going to, need, go, going to be need for data storage in the, in, in the, in the grid, you know, in the terror grid, in whatever. And this is addressing those needs. 
So as I mentioned, you know, uh, you know, we're not essentially recording what users have done, though users, the user annotations can be part of this, but we're primarily focusing on derived and temporally changing data products. The um, user access uh, is through their, their personal space. Uh, Dennis showed another version, kind of the browser version. This would be the lead-in page to that. I'll skip that. The, yikes. Uh, we view a, 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 a typical workflow. Um, a typical workflow is a gather the data products, run the forecast, analyze the results. We can gather more data products uh, based on the analysis of the results. Run a, sh a shorter, smaller forecast, analyze the results. Going over a period of 12 hours, the workflow is executing the whole time. There's a notification service that's collecting status messages, uh, and, and down on the back end is the. My, is the personal catalog that's interacting while the, the experiment is executing. Uh, I will skip this slide. Basically, it's showing one of the things we're trying to do is, is organize, uh, give the user a hierarchical organization of their files that doesn't necessarily model what's actually being stored in the metadata catalog, but it just gives them a look and feel that, that they're comfortable with. But I did want to point out the difference between the metadata catalog and the files themselves. We're making that separation. This is something that other people are doing as well. It's a, a common, I think, a, a, an emerging uh, a way of, of, of organizing data. Or essentially, you put, you put your catalog in a database. You can get the rich query access over it, and the actual file access is somewhere else. It's kind of like SRB and MCAT does something similar. Archiving the derived data products. I, I showed you the, the workflow in the previous slide done in the orange. This is that same workflow abstracted a bit. We're identifying number of reads and writes. We're trying to get a, a, an estimate of what, these work, what the provisioning for uh, the personal catalog would be. I won't go into that, just essence of time. But we've got a number of nodes. Those nodes are writing their, their intermediate products into the personal workspace. The workspace supports multiple users simultaneously. The workflow itself would be running on TerraGrid machines. The, the service itself would be running also you know, in proximity to a TerraGrid machine, if not on a TerraGrid machine. The personal workspace is Oxidi, uses Oxidi version 6.0, which is built on Globus GT3. And the database for that right now is, is um, MySQL. And I was just talking with Memo, who said that it's MySQL that is dropping indexes. Uh, <laughs> so this is new. This is, <laughs> this is good to know. <laughs> We don't want that. We're already worried about performance. <laughs> it is. OK. OK. okay. Um, so that was the derived data product. So if you take this whole derived data product coming out of the previous slide, and you look at that through time, you know, this, this particular instance, we're recording this, everything with it, that's an instance through, through time. So user, user B would have four active experiments. And you're capturing, again, you're capturing at the evolution of an experiment through time. And the challenge here is, is determining the number of versions necessary to preserve a meaningful sense of an object's evolution over time. So this is capturing the temporally changing aspect of this. Um, provenance, I, I threw this in here mainly based on a discussion that, uh, uh, that I've been having with, with another person in the audience, but I will just send her the slides and go on with this. But provenance is, a, is, a, is an important aspect of this. So where does this work with Doppler source? Let me take just a couple slides to explain what we're trying to do with Doppler source. Basically, Doppler source came as you know, it was funded partially through we got an equipment grant through Microsoft to fund a SQL Server uh, um, uh, um, um, a Windows box running SQL Server with two terabytes of disk storage. We are we've got an arrangement with um, Oklahoma University through the uh, the IRADS uh, project to get level two. Uh, NextRed Level 2 data come in directly on Abilene from Oklahoma. We are processing that. Uh, essentially, it's coming in as raw data. We're converting it to NetCDF. We're tagging it with metadata. And you know, we, we want to be able to provide uh, computation, you know, user invoke computation, uh, say invoking data mining routines, whatnot, that we host on a web server farm and to essentially augment the, the resources that we can provide for the user, the raw data, the converted data, plus the, the derived uh, uh, data products. Uh, the challenges we're taking on right now, you know, we've got the stream coming in. You know, we, we, we know what its needs are. Um, actually, let me go to another slide. Uh, we've got, you know, there's things we want to do. Uh, level 3 data, 
uh, Tomislav talked about a different, just like stage three data, which is slightly different. Level three data is, is essentially level two data that's been put through the WDSS uh, weather decision support system and certain uh, uh, feature-based uh, uh, tags are recorded, such as the presence of, of, of um, uh, a mesoscale phenomenon. And what we're trying to do is tag those two together and use this feature base to organize the temporal streams. You know, people are going to request streams of data. We organize them as, uh, based on features, and then we store and retrieve them based on features. And, you know, how do we do the global ID assignment of this? You know, how do we, you know, it was mentioned, someone mentioned yesterday is, you know, you don't want to return just a, 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 a raft of low-level events. You want to have some meaning at the collection level. How do we evolve these collection levels, keep those as additional resources and whatnot? Uh, again, the stuff we're doing right now is, is, is very low-level. Uh, you know, we're, our, our web server farm is Linux, so we're doing the Linux to, to, uh, to the .NET uh, interface to make sure we can get our job started off there. So it's kind of back-end kind of stuff we're doing right now. And we're also working on um, expanding this to include the CASA data because the radar data does, you know, the radars are, are, are I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not a meteorologist, but they're, they're somewhat uninteresting in that all of the, the descriptions, the metadata descriptions are identical. Where the CASA radars are different because they actually scan a smaller region and they can spot scan. So basically the metadata for describing them is quite a bit richer. So it's more interesting from our perspective. Uh, we've got the GIS. We've augmented this with the, the positions of the, uh, of the radars in and around the uh, Louisiana area. I mean, sorry, Louisiana, Indiana area. And you know, basically we're just trying to understand the data products. And this is just showing a correlation between the, the arrival. This is arrival for, yeah, darn it. This is the arrival for the uh, single radar and showing the, the correlation to weather, you know, in terms of, you know, this is the, the product at every three hours. We sense it every three hours and see how much data has arrived. So every three hours you get a, an arrival of somewhere between 80 megabytes down to 10 megabytes up to about 100 megabytes. So we're, we're looking and trying to look at, we're basically trying to gauge how much we can store, you know, how much capacity we need and whatnot. And where this fits in, you know, it, a couple different things. This is, again, this, this is, in, in my mind, you know, this is the external data source that's going to test the generality of, of the architecture that leads put in place for supporting data. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a nice, it's kind of pushing the edge for lead, and I, and I like that. I think, I think lead, the lead community, the data um, group needs that testing. It all also allows us to play with things like the virtual global ID and, uh, you know, and essentially applying the metadata schema to novel, these novel derived products using computer science based data mining algorithms. So it's, it's a nice platform, a nice kind of um, uh, playground for us to kind of push the edge beyond what the lead project is funding. Other questions? I know everybody wants to get out. <laughs> I know. I don't blame you. I'm antsy. I'm probably the antsiest of everybody. <laughs> Well, I think, yeah, we looked at SRB. Um, basically, you know, I made the distinction between the personal catalog and the community products. We needed a, a back-end storage that was not opened app that uh, could store both. Um, SRB, I think, is viable. We, you know, we looked, we could make, we could get the, the met, our metadata catalog to work with MCAT. We could use MCAT to store some of the lowest level stuff. Um, however, um, I think political pressures kind of stepped in the way, um, and I think also Unidata would like to see a solution that um, is more consistent with their community, uh, which is not a bad idea because you know their their involvement is is a big strength, and they've got a huge community. So we ended up going with a a solution that Unidata is is coming up with that uses pieces of RLS for its naming, uh, primarily naming and indexing of, of replicas. Um, but it's, it's also going to be unique to Unidata in that it will probably have an open DAP kind of interface, which, which will benefit us. 